because when it's Michael does, I won't get a chance. But no, seriously, um, that's my chance to introduce him, really. Look, kia ora koutou katoa, ne mihi nui ki a koutou. Ko dera koe no toko inga. Uh, it's my pleasure to be a part of this and, and to have joined with Michael. He and I have known each other for quite a number of years now and have worked on a number of <coughs> projects over the years related to um, virtual and distance learning, and in particular the work um, of the, the VLN going back to 2014, I think, wasn't it, Michael, somewhere in there? And um, and so this, I was excited when Michael brought the opportunity to work on this particular project forward because, as he can explain more, he's done this sort of thing uh, in the North American context for a number of years now. And it's something that I has been sadly lacking in New Zealand in terms of providing a baseline for uh, our Ministry of Education in particular and the sort of successive ministries and government uh, officials who come in and try and get their head around this and, and look at the, the overall context. And particularly um, post-COVID, when there was a, a, an upsurge of interest in the virtual, online, flexible distance learning. Um, so my pleasure to, to, uh, to have been a part of this, and I'm going to hand over to Michael now, and he can uh, introduce himself. Well, thank you, Derek, and uh, I, I'm glad to to be here with this group. And I, I'm looking through, and I see a lot of familiar names. So, uh, uh, as Catherine mentioned, um, I suspect that uh, uh, I'm I'm we we are both known to most of the folks here. And um, just uh, actually, thank you for making me co-host there, Catherine. And I will start sharing in a second here now. But uh, as Derek mentioned, actually. Derek and I first met at a conference in Montreal back in 2005, um, not to make either of us feel old. And we've been fooling around with with these uh, with stuff with the virtual learning network since uh, I had the opportunity to come over in 2008 and keynote at a dean's conference. And uh, shortly thereafter, we we started collaborating on some of this stuff. And um, yes, this is a study that we've both long had in the making and uh, had been close to actually doing on a couple of occasions. Um, and uh, the closest we ever got was potentially having uh, ministry funding and Flans backing back in the January, February of 2020. And well, I think we all know what happened about a month later, which sort of sidelined that individual project. Uh, and it took us another four years to, to get to where we are. Um, so in the interest of time, I uh, I won't dwell on any of that, although I could go uh, into a lot of it. Um, so as Derek mentioned, um, this is a particular project and uh, uh, that we're looking at a, basically a national perspective uh, of uh, distance learning throughout uh, New Zealand. Um, I'd like to begin by recognizing the, the four uh, groups that actually provided funding to make this particular study funding or resourcing to make this study possible and actually a couple of subsequent studies that we're, we're currently working on um, and you know without them in all honesty this would not have happened and uh, beyond that we're hoping that these groups will continue that kind of excuse me, support so that we are able to continue this work because as Derek mentioned, this has become an annual thing in Canada and it was an annual thing in the US before I got started in Canada. And um, we'd like it to become an annual thing in, in New Zealand. In fact, we're actually in the process now of working backwards uh, to get some data. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to look at the website, I, I know it's been pushed out uh, uh, along the, the next, um, uh, network a number of times, but the actual uh, resource is available there, and I should probably just grab this and drop it in the chat while we're speaking, so that way uh, you've got it and you can um, grab it from there. And um, so this is a project, as Derek mentioned, we first sort of recommended it for New Zealand in a couple of studies that we did back in, in 2011 and 2013. Um, and we were suggesting at the time that it be loosely modeled after ones that I had been doing in Canada and that a group uh, at the time, Evergreen Associates, now Digital Learning Collaborative, were doing in the US. Um, in the actual report itself, um, if you are newer to the field, so if you've joined the field in recent years, 
um, getting a broader understanding of where a lot of this developed is is kind of useful. And uh, in the report itself, we go through and outline a history of uh, the school sector distance learning that's happened. Um, it, it's fairly comprehensive. We've actually expanded upon it in a piece that should be published in the Journal of Flexible, Open and Distance Learning. Um, I'm hoping by the end of this month uh, where we were able to fill in some of the areas where we were only briefly able to mention things within uh, the report because, uh, well, the report was 130 pages as it was and we sort of you know, we, we figured that most people get tired after the first 50 or 60 pages, so uh, we gave up on it after that. But uh, the article that we've got coming out in uh, the, the Flans Journal um, fills in some of the areas in which we were a little bit lax in, particularly the more recent uh, developments. So things from really 2000 to the present, we spend a lot more time on uh, than what we did in, in the report. Um, so the actual report itself or the actual study itself, what we were interested in was looking at how uh, different types of providers were governed uh, within the school sector and distance learning in New Zealand, uh, how they were resourced, and then exactly what was sort of the scope or the extent of the activity. Uh, the way in which we went about this was we actually sent out surveys to each of the providers that we were able to identify. And I'll be honest and say that some of the known providers were actually quite helpful in identifying providers that we were unaware of and and that continues um, in the post uh, report uh, work that we've been doing uh, that we've had some funding to do uh, folks on this call have continued to provide us with new leads that we can uh, follow up on of providers that weren't included in the actual report itself um, in many cases, those surveys required follow-up interviews, both with the specific people that we were actually getting information from, so the representatives from each of the providers that we had identified, but also folks that had been in the field prior to um, a, a lot of these developments, so being able to provide some of the historical context, uh, being able to provide some of the perspective that wasn't sort of in the trenches of the individual program, um, which was quite useful. And then we did a lot of document analysis, and in particular when it came to uh, both the legislative aspects, uh, the regulatory aspects, and also uh, with the individual programs themselves. They provided us with, a, 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 or individual providers themselves, they provided us with a lot of documents that we were able to really comb through to see exactly what was in there. And, and I think in some cases identify areas that while it made sense to them being an insider uh, as outsiders with Derek and I looking at these things, it raised some questions that came up um, and generated a lot of back and forth, uh, particularly with some programs. Um, so to sort of skirt through a lot of that, um, when we looked at this, and, and I used the phrase entities in the report when we started, but providers is the nomenclature that we've we've decided to use only because it's what the government, the, it's the terminology that the government was using, uh, particularly around cools, but also some of the consultive efforts that they had prior to uh, the introduction of the communities of online learning uh, that they brought forward, uh, the, the phrase or the term providers of distance learning or providers of distance education or providers of virtual learning and they used all three really uh, quite commonly distance ed, distance learning was probably the most common uh, one which is why we've used that particular term um, but the providers was the term that the government tended to use for folks that were either directly providing or folks that were brokering distance learning services that were being directly provided by others um, so that was sort of our catch-all. Uh, we divided these up into schools and programs. Um, the schools were ones that actually come directly out of the Education Act. And um, they were divided, obviously, into public ones and private ones. And as you can see, here are the, the various uh, public school types uh, that have offered some form of distance learning, uh, either at present or in the past. And I say in the past because... Uh, at present, there aren't any of the tertiaries that are offering school-level distance learning, uh, but in the past, they've been active in this space, uh, particularly if you look at that period of 
um, the late 2000s and early 2000 teens. Um, there was a, a lot of activity there. Um, in terms of numerically speaking, obviously, when you're looking at distant school, uh, there's a single one. There are four special institutions. Uh, there was one state school, so one regular brick and mortar school that was providing distance learning that we highlighted. We suspect that's probably the area that's going to grow the most because there's probably a lot more of that happening and it's just not really known. Um, there weren't any tertiary institutions right now. And there were nine different private uh, schools that we identified as either registering to offer distance learning or indicating that they were offering distance learning, although in all honesty, not all did. And I'll get to that in a second. Uh, the other type that we had uh, were programs. And the reason we decided upon the term program uh, was because when you look at the literature and even when you look at the individual uh, information that oftentimes had been documented by some of these entities or these providers in the past, uh, program was the most common term that we found. Um, so program was basically someone who was a, a provider of distance learning or a broker of distance learning that wasn't recognized as a school under the, the Education Act. Um, so, um, you know, the main ones that, that we have in the report are Cotuaco and NetNZ, and, and um, um, there's a, a private one that are not, or for-profit one that we've we identified in there as well, and there's actually a new nonprofit that um, has been identified to us that we've reached out and that we're in the process of beginning to add to the project right now. Um, the programs come in two forms. Nonprofits, so those would be the ones that you would sort of consider as public, uh, but because it's not a school, uh, public wasn't really the right term. So nonprofit uh, was the, the 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 what we thought was the most appropriate descriptive term or most appropriate adjective, if you will. Um, and then there was one that was basically, I mean, it was a for-profit company that was uh, providing education in, in, in as a program. So they weren't a school. Um, but they were, you know, it was a for-profit entity. Um, so the ones that we specifically identified, and here's sort of the categories. Um, so when you look at the sort of the public ones, uh, we combined the distance learning schools and the special institutions into one group there because I would have ran out of space if I didn't. Um, and I also shortened the nomenclature at the, the top because, again, I would have run out of space if I didn't on this slide. Um, but basically, you're looking at uh, Takura, formerly the Correspondence School, the three health schools, as well as uh, Deaf Education New Zealand. Um, in terms of the nonprofit distance learning programs, as I mentioned, you're looking at Kotuiaku and at NZ. And then the one state school or public school that we identified as providing distance learning uh, that we identified was Rose Mini, Rose Mini College. Um, and then, as you can see on the right, um, right, stage left, I don't know. Uh, but on that side of the screen, you will see uh, the private ones. So there were nine of those uh, that we were able to identify and then that one for-profit program. Now it's interesting because um, when you look at those that actually participated or cooperated with the survey, um, as you can see, all of the, what you would consider public programs, uh, we're all willing to participate, although some of them um, participated at the bare minimum level, to be honest with you. One in particular was very difficult to, to, to work with, um, one of the, the, the public distance learning schools, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, the rest were actually more than willing to, to, to participate um, and were really interested in participating because not only did, you know, they were basically wanted to know what we would find. Um, because they, like many, I think of you in the room, probably have a good context of what's happening in your own environment, but not really what's happening in the broader perspective. As, as Derek mentioned earlier, you know, this idea of providing that baseline, you know, to be able to compare yourselves against. And um, so pretty much everyone on the left side of the screen were very interested in uh, participating for that reason, to be able to see sort of, you know, what's actually happening field wide. Um, unfortunately, the ones on the right weren't so cooperative in, in, in that fashion. Um, now, one of the things we did discover as we were going through this 
was two of the nine uh, private programs, while they were listed as or described as providing distance education, actually didn't enroll any students during the 23, 20, during the 2023 school year. Um, so really, there was only sort of seven there that could have actually provided any specific data. Uh, now, we provided profiles for all nine, but um, we... Uh, those ones wouldn't have had any data, even if they had decided to participate. Um, so just to give you a little bit of sense, as I mentioned, the ones that were up in the schools category were primarily governed by uh, the Education and Training Act. Those ones were also had a lot of uh, things that were published in the New Zealand Gazette that regulated how they were governed. Um, in the case of Takura, they also had a separate uh, collective agreement. Uh, with the, uh, the the teachers union that applied specifically to them. And then the only other really commonality that we had there was that all of the the what we would consider nonprofit programs that were providing distance learning were all governed under a an education trust, um, which was, uh, um, I wouldn't say surprising, but at least was interesting because it was consistent. Like no one else went a different route. They were all going that same route. And, um, and in terms Michael, of can I just make ahead. mention on that previous slide? Yep. Because uh, it may be New Zealand Gazette is the New Zealand Gazette. So it's not the Education Gazette. This is the New Zealand Gazette that gazettes membership. Mm. Yeah. So basically, it's basic. It is where all of the regulatory items that are passed, usually orders in council, get put. Legislative regulatory um, body is not the right word because it's not a body, but it's a document essentially. So, yeah. Um, in terms of the actual activity, this is sort of what we were able to uh, report. Uh, some of this we can say with high levels of confidence. Uh, some of this, and and hence all of the asterisks that you see all over the table, uh, you know, there's a lot of, well, maybes uh, that, that we have in there. So, um, you know, we're able to basically say that there's, you know, um, probably in the vicinity of between 13 and 14,000 uh, supplemental students. And by supplemental, meaning those who are enrolled in a brick and mortar school and who are taking one or more classes at a distance, uh, regardless of medium, uh, we can say that there's probably somewhere in the vicinity of 22 to 23,000 students that never step foot into a brick and mortar school or rarely step foot into a brick and mortar school and do most of their learning at a distance. Um, and, you know, I, the ranges are there because as an example, if you were to use the health schools, um, you can see that between the three health schools, there's about 2,800 students that are listed there. Um, many of those students will spend some time back in their brick and mortar community based schools. In fact, that's the goal of the health school is to reintegrate these students back into their regular school. Um, so if you look at the Northern Health School as an example, you know, there's roughly, you know, shy of 2000 students there. Many of those 2000 students would have actually not been truly full time at a distance. They might have spent one day a week back in their community school, or they might have spent the first four months of the school year in their community school and only spent the last, you know, the rest of the school year in the health school, or they might have began the year in the health school, but by June may have integrated back into their regular community school. Um, so, you know, there's a, a lot of variability there. Um, if you break that down in terms of, you know, both levels and types of school, it, it provides some sort of interesting uh, data. And again, you'll notice the asterisks are missing here, but keep in mind that there should be asterisks after pretty much every number there, even the ones that are giving you ranges. Um, but you know, at, at the primary level, at best, we're looking at probably about 1% of the students across the country. Uh, at the secondary level, probably uh, upwards of 9%, although that might be a little bit lower, maybe a little bit higher. Um, the group that obviously has the highest is the special schools, but again, we're not sure exactly how many of those are at a distance or for that matter, how many they're actually truly at a distance for long periods of time. 
Um, and you can see the range nationally is in that 4% range, uh, which is why if you sort of look at the takeaways from that aspect of the study, we can say that there's about 4% of kids in New Zealand last school year that took one or more of their courses online at some point throughout the school year. Maybe not for a full term, um, but at some point. Um, the level of actual activity or scope of activity varies significantly between level of student and type school. And, you know, if you want to look at sort of the range, we can say that it ranges from about 1% in the primary population to just under or coming close to 10% in the secondary population, which, you know, is actually not that uncommon for most countries. Um, in terms of the instructional models, and this is actually where we want to focus upon. So everything we've done up to date, we actually spent a full hour talking about when at the Flans webinar. So if you want to really dive into that, but you don't want to read through the 130 page report, just go watch the first roughly 45 minutes of the hour long Flans report, and you'll get a good summary of, of, of that in much detail. Uh, we spent about three minutes on this slide in the Flans report, but it's this stuff that I want to spend the rest of our time today with, because I think this is the stuff that for this group of, of, of participants, I think is much more interesting. So as we looked across the range, there were three, really three kind of dominant models. Uh, there were providers that focused primarily upon asynchronous uh, models of, of instruction. There were pro providers that focused primarily upon synchronous models of instruction, and then providers that focus mainly upon independent learning models of instruction. And when I say focused upon, that's not necessarily all they did, but that's sort of where the, the main or the bulk of the actual instruction that took place occurred. Um, so if we look at each of these, so let's start with just the asynchronous one as an example. Um, so Takura was probably the largest user of this, although not the only one. There were actually at least two of the private schools that used asynchronous as their primary model of, of delivery. Um, so here's a couple of samples from the, actually that you can go in and look at. And if you go into the report, there's actually a link that takes you to where you can log into this and they have a, a, a username. And if I remember correctly, there's about eight or 10 courses at the, the primary early childhood level. Uh, and then about, I think it was six or eight courses at the secondary level where they put in like demo lessons that you can actually go in and look to see what they've done in here. Uh, so this is one from the early childhood one. It's actually one on colors, uh, which I thought was interesting. And as you go through, uh, basically you sort of both scroll down as well as click through different aspects of the lesson. So, and it begins with this um, text and image based introduction, although it's narrated as well. So it's being provided in multiple mediums for uh, the individual. Um, as you go through, there are things that they're suggesting and keep in mind, this is for an early childhood uh, age. They're making suggestions to whoever is supervising the student. And in the case of Takuro, if you're at the early childhood level, you're actually engaged primarily in full-time online learning. So these are kids that don't go into a school. Um, so there's someone in theory at home that's helping them through these. Uh, so they actually provide advice to whomever that, um, that coach is at home, if you will. Um, or I guess to use the term that you see within the, often in the secondary environment, the e dean type role, but obviously in the home as opposed to in the school. Um, there are specific, you know, really granular suggestions that they've put in there. Um, there are specific things that they task the student to do. So they actually ask, you know, to get the student to do things. So one is make a color uh, poster and stuff like that. Um, and as you can see, each of these sections are narrated as well as you're going through it. Um, the language, the even the size of the font um, tends to be a little bit different than what you see at the secondary level. Thank you for dropping that link in there, Rachel. Um, and then at the end, there's a specific task that you ask them to do. And as part of that, you have to upload that particular, the, the parent is supposed to, a parent or guardian is supposed to upload that into the portfolio so that the teachers can access it and then you move on to the next lesson. 
Um, as you can see, here's an example from the secondary level, and this is uh, one of the science courses. Um, it's a little bit different. First thing to notice, and, and this actually struck me, um, I didn't change the font size with any of these. So, you know, if you just look at just as one example, the difference in the size of the font between what they provide for, you know, someone who's say 14 or 15 or 16 compared to someone who's, you know, four or five or six, um, you know, the difference in types of the types of illustrations that are there, you notice it's not video based in the primary one, but it is narrated so that if you don't know what the words are, someone is telling you those words. Whereas when you move into the secondary one, um, you start off with these little instructional videos. And it's interesting because as you go through, there are videos about pretty much each of the subtopics that are in there. And unlike the primary one, whereas this whole sequence here is basically designed to be one full topic that you might spend a couple of hours on, uh, the way in which they've set up the secondary programs are each of the lessons that they've put together are roughly one hour in length. Um, so they're designed to be a much shorter kind of, of environment. And then each of the individual videos that you find there tend to be the shortest ones I saw as I was looking through. And I clicked on probably about 20 of them. Um, usually about five to six minutes were on the short end. Uh, 10 to 12 minutes were usually on the long end. Uh, so they tended to be, you know, at a level that you would maybe expect to keep the attention of a, you know, 15, 16, 17 year old learner. Um, what they go through, and, and as you can see again, a lot more text than what you saw before. Um, like you might see in a traditional secondary school textbook, a lot of images and figures and charts that explain a lot or that help illustrate a lot of the points that are there. Um, there are a lot of things that would allow you to click on stuff. So as you can see here, you know, there's actually four of these that were here. I picked this one and clicked on it because it's Canadian as am I. Uh, so, you know, I had to sort of, you know, plant the flag there uh, as we were going. And um, not that I know much about Canadian pond weed, but uh, I did learn a bit as I was going through it, having said that. Uh, but each of, there were four of these sorry, particular things here. And, you know, you had to sort of be active a bit. So it wasn't just sort of scrolling down. You had to click on each of these to open them up and then you could close them after that. Um, there were a lot of these, make sure I didn't skip anything there. There were a lot of these little self-assessment things. So things that weren't captured by the the learning management system that was delivering it. And this is all being delivered in desire to learn, which is a proper learning management system as opposed to more of a, a Teams or Google Classroom environment, which can emulate certain aspects of a complete learning management system, but in and of themselves aren't learning management systems, miss many of the individual features that you'd find in a proper uh, learning management or course management system. Um, but a lot of these items here were these self-assessments. So they were uh, allowing the student to test their own knowledge without it counting towards their evaluation. So, and uh, there was probably one to three of these after each of the individual little sections of each lesson there. So as I go through and watch the video, as I read through the content and look at this, the, the, you know, figures and charts and stuff that are there, then I can go and check to see, do I actually know what they taught me here? And it'll give me, you know, feedback individually uh, as I'm going through this. Um, and then, uh, you know, it, it continues on and, and uh, you can see again, some of the, the uh, more granular information that's in there. Again, that idea of, you know, it doesn't look that different than an online textbook to be perfectly honest with you. Um, with the exception of that self-assessment piece built in. Um, you know, here's another good example of, of the charts. And actually, if I could scroll down past this, there was probably like eight or 10 different uh, examples, you know, with the, the charts there of the different DNA replications that could happen and how you uh, move them about. Um, and then you get to the actual proper assessment that's there. So there's actually for each of the lessons that are in there, there's a specific assessment that they have to do that they would upload, oops, my mind's moving around so much, that they would upload into Dropbox. And then that was actually what got um, assessed by the teacher. And throughout this, um, as you're in the system, it's actually just above this line. I wish I actually screenshot it, but there's a little spot there where you can, you know, ask it actually, it says, ask your teacher. 
Um, so it gives you an opportunity to interact um, asynchronously with your teacher. And in the menu options, there's a spot there where you can see when your teacher's office hours are. So if you wanted to have that synchronous interaction with them, they actually have set office hours that they are available for that purpose. Um, so it was a really nice kind of system. Like I say, these are all examples from Takura, but two of uh, at least two of the private schools that we looked at, uh, specifically Crimson um, and uh, one school, both are primarily asynchronous in their, their delivery and both have, uh, at least based on what we were able to see from the, the public side of things um, and with Crimson, what they showed me when I sat down and interviewed with them, um, have this sort of content built within the learning management system. The second most common model was a primarily synchronous model. Um, and in these cases, these were ones that were using really a tool kind of like what we're using now, um, you know, and probably using it in a much more effective way than what I'm using it now, to be honest with you. Um, and many of you who are teachers in the room, probably this is the model that you're likely familiar with. And you know all of the tools that that I could be using right now to make this a much more engaging and interactive uh, session for us. You know, I, we've been using the chat a little bit, but I haven't really been encouraging it. Um, you know, there's all sorts of polling features that I could be using and I could be encouraging you to, you know, use reactions to let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow, or if you already know something or not. Um, you know, there, there's a number of different things I can um, actually just in the past, I guess it's been about 14 months, I can give you all the ability to annotate things. So, you know, as we're looking at some of these things, I could be asking you to be drawing on the screen, and all of those different types of things, um, you know, all of all things that I think you guys are, are largely familiar with. Um, as we looked at the the synchronous model, one of the interesting things about it was that uh, for the most part, it was set up, it was primarily used by programs as opposed to schools, although it was used by some schools. Um, those schools that it was used by tended to be ones that also cooperated with other schools. So I'm thinking of, um, you know, the special institution categories um, that tended to use them. And I, I put this up here as an example. I mean, it's not, it's not representative of the way all schools look. Uh, but it is representative of how some schools look. And, and what would often happen in this kind of model, um, and obviously this is a secondary example, uh, because at the primary level, it's not timetabled out like this. Um, but at the secondary level, uh, what would tend to happen is, you know, in this example, you've got a student that's taking five classes uh, this particular term, and you can see when they're scheduled throughout the week. Uh, course C is their distance class or their virtual class. And the school has decided to put it in period three because obviously whatever the student wanted to do in class A, B, D, and E happened to be offered in one, two, four, and five. Um, so the one that was empty was called period three or, or section three, class three, if you will. Um, so that's where they just stuck the distance one. Now the virtual program is offering the one synchronous class they have the week. And that's sort of the model that, that we found at least at the, sync, at the secondary level was oftentimes it was one synchronous hour a week. Um, and then the rest of the time was supposed to be asynchronous work. Um, the program has decided to schedule that one synchronous hour in the first period on Tuesday, uh, which means that who, the student has to you know, get the cooperation of whoever is teaching course A in their school to be able to leave the room and go sit in uh, you know, whatever place they're doing to do their distance learning to take that synchronous class. Um, it also relies upon the fact that the student's actually going to be doing work Monday through or Monday and Wednesday through Friday actually on whatever has been assigned by their distance teacher uh, during that period of time. Um, the response that we got from the primary section of Kotuiaku, uh, it was basically a 50-50 split in most cases. So if I remember correctly uh, from the data, and Rachel can correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, um, that most of the classes tended to be an hour or two a week um, that was scheduled for the distance class. 
half of which would be synchronous and the other half they would be working on asynchronous. So it would be a 30 minute session uh, once, maybe twice a week uh, with two, one or two 30 minute sessions where they're, yeah, 30 minute Zoom, 30 minute async. So it wasn't, yeah, so it's an hour, not two hours. So, um, you know, so with the secondary, it tended to be 20% synchronous um, in the primary level, 50% synchronous for the most part. Um, and that was consistent with the special institutions that we looked at as well uh, for many of those that uh, the older they got, the closer it got to a, anywhere from a quarter to a fifth of the time synchronous. The younger they were, the more time, uh, in some cases reaching 60 and 70 percent synchronous uh, for, you know, I'm thinking the health schools in particular. Um, you know, and one of the things that we have to remember with the synchronous model is those that tended to rely upon the synchronous model, they tended to be in a supplemental kind of environment. Um, so the kids were in a school, and as you can see by this chart, you know, there are three schools here represented by the dotted lines. Uh, so you can see here's three students in school A, uh, three more students here in school B, and three more students down here in school C. Um, you know, and this white area in the center, that's their virtual class. Um, so they are coming together with an online teacher. The schools have an ED or depending upon, you know, in New Zealand, most of it's used the term ED. Um, when you look outside of New Zealand, uh, facilitators often uh, used. Some cases, mentor is another term that you see used. Um, mediating teacher is also a term that you see used. So those are sort of the four terms you often see used. But there's support at the at the the local level. Um, you know, if it's not an e dean, you know, there's still a tech teacher there that's you know making sure that the technology works. They still have that local administrator. They still have you know all of the local teachers that would be there to provide those soft skills. Uh, for them, um, you know, so there's the, a, a much sort of more robust kind of model that you'd have in uh, many of these synchronous programs, whereas in the, um, which I think is one of the reasons why we see them relied upon at the supplemental level, as opposed to the full time level, because uh, at the full time level, basically everything that's in this dotted line has to be done by the parent or guardian. Um, and many cases, many parents or guardians don't have that ability to provide that level of support, which is why we don't see it happening that that often. Um, the last one that we're looking at is the independent learning model. Um, and this was primarily used by either private schools, um, main, well, with the exception of the, the two I mentioned and then one that did use the synchronous model. Uh, so of the nine of them, six of them used the independent learning model, as did the for-profit program uh, used this a great deal. Um, and in all honesty, independent learning um, is sort of, I guess, a, a, a technical way of describing what most of you are probably uh, used to experiencing when you think about the historical correspondence school. Um, these are either, in some cases, paper packets, in some cases, online packets that are sent to the kids. The kids may have some daily or weekly real-time interaction with the teacher, but most cases they are independently working through uh, these packets. And, and of the programs that used these, um, at least half of them, possibly more, because obviously we didn't get a lot of participation from them, actually used a program called Accelerated Christian Education, or ACE. And their packets were called PACES, because packets of Accelerated Christian uh, Education. Um, and you can see sort of a description of them here. Uh, this is actually a picture of what they look like. And you can get a sense as to, um, you know, the this is the company's description of what it is. Um, so you can see there's 12 paces per level um, and you would expect the kid to do 72 paces in a year, which basically means they're doing six courses or six core subjects, as you can see at the top there, and they list off what those are. Um, in the case, obviously, you know, accelerated Christian education means that it is a Christian focused one. Um, and what I think concerns me the most about this, and we only make passing reference to it in the report, 
um, but there's a fair degree of literature about this. This particular program is um, well known, at least within North American and European circles, for its um, questionable curriculum. Um, this is a curriculum that's known as being quite sexist, in many cases somewhat racist. Um, it talked about the positive aspects of apartheid, for example, right up until about 2012. Um, you know, long after apartheid was, you know, uh, uh, abolished and seen as a complete abomination, these guys were still talking about the positive things. But I I'm in the U.S., so I can't really talk much about that because the state of Florida has a curriculum that talks about, you know, the positive aspects of slavery and the things that it provided for the slaves. So, um, you know, glass houses and all. Um, but, you know, so there are some very questionable things about this. The science curriculum actually teaches um, creationism alongside of other actual theories of science that, you know, are actual theories as opposed to something that's completely faith-based. Um, and, um, you know, so I, I do mention that because it, it is one of the concerning factors because one of the schools that we know you who are using this program are likely to actually apply to become a charter school, a publicly funded charter school in the coming year. And my guess is they probably won't change their distance education. So your public tax dollars will be paying for uh, an education that's, you know, teaching creationism the, at the same side as, you know, teaching gravity. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, one of the things that we, we got from this independent learning model, um, obviously, because it's a full time program, um, they don't sort of dictate things for the most part. So as you can see, this is a typical day in one of these private schools, um, and it's given to parents as a suggestion as to how they can organize their day, um, but it's just a suggestion. So kids don't actually have to do this. So even that beginning part, that first 30 minutes at the beginning of each day, which, you know, the, the teacher is actually leading asynchronous session, parents don't have to have their kids show up to that. That is an optional activity. Um, you know, so they can essentially, really it is publicly funded to some extent. Homeschooling is what you're looking at here. Um, you know, because while they are private schools, private schools do get some public funding, whereas a homeschool student just gets a, you know, very small homeschooling stipend and that's it. Um, you know, these guys are getting, you know, while not equal to public funds for this, uh, a significant amount compared to what the homeschool stipend is to be able to provide education to this student. And it is completely option, uh, you know, it is completely uh, 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 optional for them to be able to do any of this stuff. Um, as long as they are submitting the packets at a reasonable pace, that's all that really matters to them. Um, so looking at sort of, you know, what, what to look at next, um, and I want to leave some time for questions. I, I will say that uh, we actually did do a secondary study along with the original one that was looking at um, basically what the stakeholders, both the folks directly involved with being providers of distance learning as well as those who were uh, tangential to that experience, um, what they sort of their vision for a, few, a future school system and what were some of the things that needed to change for that. Uh, Derek and I are currently writing that up. Uh, we'll be presenting it at the Flans conference in about two weeks. So we've got a firm deadline in terms of when we actually have to finish the write up. Um, and then we actually have a request right now that is out to the providers. We're actually starting to get some of those back. Um, we had some funding that we're able to pass along to uh, a small amount of funding. We're able to pass along to the individual providers to try to get their data from uh, 2019 through to 2022. So we're able to uh, be able to hopefully by the end of this school year, talk about what things look like pre-pandemic throughout, you know, that sort of three years of kind of pandemic impacted time. And then 2023 is really sort of the first post-pandemic year. And then hopefully this will become an annual thing. And uh, those of you that are involved as being providers of distance learning will hear from us again, probably in April next year, uh, looking for data from the current 2024 school year so that uh, we'll be able to continue this out. Um, so again, the website is right there, and I think we've got about 10 minutes for questions. 
uh, unless Derek wants to add anything uh, that I might have missed along the way. You're muted there, Derek, so we see you moving, but... Uh, stop the background noise. <coughs> I've got nothing more to add to that comprehensive uh, overview, really. I think the um, the big thing will be interesting for me is that next part that we're currently working on uh, around the, the future vision for how this holds together, uh, thinking about the New Zealand context and the way that this study is going to provide our ministry with, like we said at the beginning, a benchmark. But now we've got the opportunity using a lot of that feedback to say, so what? what really is the desired next step beyond this? What's a future state? Mm -hmm. So with that, I will throw it open. We've got